So there's very little you can control once the tournament day starts. You know, you can control a lot in training. Um, and then afterwards, then you just got to focus on, you know, uh, just the little things, which is good warm up and, uh, you know, making sure that if you're not in the right frame of mind, you figure out what works for you to get back to that space. Matt Gentry, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Me too. I found your your old blog from the from the 2008-2009 era um, oh, wow. and was able to pull it up. So I got some good stuff here to talk about. I'm excited. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure you're going to refresh some memories for me. <laughs> I got to know, when did you wrestle the match with earplugs in? What's the story behind that? Um, it was actually at Fargo of my senior year. So you know, I really wasn't nationally ranked in high school. Uh, I grew up in Oregon, uh, the middle division. There used to be three divisions in Oregon. And uh, my senior year, so after I'd graduated, I'd already committed to Stanford. Um, I just had a lot of belief in myself. And I went to Fargo. You know, I'd never placed at a national tournament. I'd never really even competed in them. And uh, I took fourth in Greco. Um, and so... Uh, uh, it was one of those matches. I think it was like a, one of the round robin matches to determine where I was going to end up. Um, I, I just was so in the zone that I, I kept my earplugs in. And earplugs was something I used to use when I was uh, competing because noise is energy draining. So you're at a long tournament all day. You know, there's lots of whistles, shouting. You know what the wrestling environment is at a tournament. Um, it was just one way for me to do some energy management. But I was so in the zone, I forgot to take them out. I love that you were such a student of your routine and your processes around a competition. A absolutely. And I, I think that's something, you know, I try and coach and give back as much as I can. And I do think that the mental side of, uh, of the sport, which everybody talks about, um, I still think it's undertaught. It's still undertaught. It's talked about and say, this is important. But um, I think there needs to be another step with coaches and it's X, Y, and Z. You know, these are the X, Y, Z steps you have to take. Not just saying, Hey, this is important work on it, but these are important work on it. This is how you work on it. So. Could you imagine a coach saying, here's a single that gets important, figure it out. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's like, um, you know, what are the proper ways to set goals? What are the proper ways to, you know, prepare for a match? What is normal nerves and what's, you know, anxiety that's going to be energy draining. So. And were your parents competitive people? No. <laughs> In fact, I mean, my parents are not sports fans. I, I didn't grow up uh, watching any sports on television. I played a lot of sports as a kid, uh, mostly soccer and wrestling through high school. But, um, you know, my parents, uh, I'm a big proponent of Carol Dweck's research, mm -hmm. which Grit. Growth, growth mindset. No, growth mindset. Growth mindset. Okay. Yep. Uh, versus a fixed mindset. And um, it's something I preach a lot to my kids. It helps redefine success. Uh, but my parents were really giving me those tools and that framework on how to look at wins and losses, you know, way before the research came out. And so I think, uh, you know, we talked about how important the mental side is. My, my parents weren't competitive. They were always focused on how can we get better? And so I think that helped me more than them, you know, more than my dad pulling a, uh, pulling me aside in the living room and showing me, you know, here's a finish to a double leg. Yeah. That's going back to growth mindset. It's amazing that people used to think we had like a fixed brain, that it wasn't elastic, you know, that you were just whatever you, that's where you were born with, you were good with, and you couldn't improve your station. Um, I would, I was just reading that. I couldn't believe that that's how people used to think it. I guess there's some people who think that now it's kind of crazy though. Uh, absolutely. And it's just a competitive world. And so, um, you know, it, it's hard to take a loss. It's hard to fail. Uh, you know, it's never a fun process. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, it's not the most important. Uh, right. And it's easy to forget that and think it is the most important. So, um, so yeah. So if you go back to your North Valley days, way back, you know, before you ever jumped on the scene, you know, Oregon, I didn't realize that Oregon had three classes, but you were a, a hundred pounder, you know, a scrappy little guy. What, and I've, I've heard you read that you just love wrestling. 
why did you love it so much or what hooked you at that young age to carry you through? <clears throat> um, I, I mean, okay, let's go way back then. I, I brought a flyer home from school when I was in the first grade and I was very competitive as a kid. Uh, my parents said that I was a terrible loser in like board games around the house. And I was a terrible winner too. I wasn't good at either of those. <laughs> and so um, I was also the smallest kid in my class until probably my junior year of high school. And I went to a small school. Um, but, you know, my, I think my parents thought, well, this might be a good fit for him physically and mentally. And so, uh, you know, they just took me to a practice and I was very lucky just to have a coach that didn't teach a lot. Um, he was very, you know, he probably taught me 10 moves total, um, in my, you know, first grade through eighth grade, uh, career. And, uh, but I, I was a pretty good feel for the sport in terms of scrambling, mm -hmm. um, or just being in an, uh, unorthodox position where to, where to go. Um, but then was big for me was my sophomore year. I started working with a coach privately called Sergio Gonzalez. He was a 1972 Olympian at 48 kilo. Um, and he just, um, you know, he's, he's kind of hippie at heart uh, and he just loves life and he loves wrestling and he loves the, the art of it and the flow of wrestling. And he kind of taught that love of it to me. Mm. And, you know, he never taught me moves. He taught me a lot about positions. Um, and so, you know, I just love the creativity of, uh, you know, being, you know, you could wrestle somebody 10 times and you're going to be in, you know, you could wrestle somebody 10 times and have 10 single legs exactly the same. And they're all going to be just a little bit different. So. And there's just so many layers to it. Like you can never get to the bottom of like the technique world. It just keeps going and going. There's so many different variations. Absolutely. And it just, that circles back to growth mindset, you know, is that, you know, you can never, you, there's always tweaks you can make in technique to, to get better. And so I think you see that with the, the best wrestlers and, you know, they're willing to learn from a high school kid at a camp that they give. Yeah. So. Now was Sergio an Oregon guy born and raised? Uh, no, he was actually uh, born and raised in California. And then he wrestled at UCLA. He lost to, uh, oh gosh, uh, John Miller, I think University of Oregon's like first NCAA champ okay. uh, in the NCAA final. Uh, but yeah. Well, the reason I was asking was I know on that 72 team, Rick Sanders was there and he was an Oregon guy. Yeah. And people forget about the great tradition that Oregon wrestling has. I mean, yeah. um, I've had Dan Russell on the show and, you know, he beat Pat Smith his first match and was a four timer in his own right. And, you know, that Portland State team was deadly in the early 90s. And so it's just uh, it breaks my heart that, you know, the West Coast footprint. You know, you're a Stanford guy, so we'll talk about it. But it just breaks my heart to see any kind of decline in colleges out there because it's such a strong tradition on the West Coast. Yeah, it is. You know, it is sad that the those opportunities are getting smaller. So, you know, UCLA, Washington, those Portland State, they all have great, great programs, a lot of tradition that, yeah. that no longer present. And, you know, current wrestlers don't even think about that. Right. And we can't forget the great Larry Owings was actually from Oregon. So right. man, it runs great out there. So you got that as a background, you meet a, a mentor in high school and that carries you through. Um, and I had read that when you got fourth at Fargo and Greco, that was the first time you really kind of stepped back and realized that goal setting works. So I wanted to ask you, what was your process for setting goals back then? Uh, you know, I made it, a lot of people set goals and they just set them and forget them, I say, because, uh, you know, they can have a goal, but if, if it's not top of mind, um, it's not, you're, you're not using it as, as well as you could. Mm -hmm. um, and really, goals are great for motivation um, and helping you guide your habits. But your habits is actually what's going to help you achieve your goal. And so for me, that process was, you know, I created some big goals, like, be a Fargo All-American. That was my goal. I printed it out. I put it above my bed on my mirror. Some of the things in my wallet, in my car, I was seeing it constantly. So every time I said it, I would just repeat something back to myself is like, I'm going to be an All-American. But that, uh, that only takes you so far, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the better aspect of doing that is, you know, I'm getting in the car. I know I have an early morning training. And I get in the car, I see that. And then I know, you know what, I got to get home by a certain amount because I see that goal in front of me. 
I'm not going to stay out till two in the morning and, and sacrifice my sleep, which is going to ultimately sacrifice my training. Yeah. Or, you know, my buddies are going to have pizza. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to choose to make a better health choice. So. Yeah. It's uh, and the crazy thing is that it's not even like a sexy thing. It's just consistent goals for years or consistent habits for years on end. Um, and, you know, it's even, probably easier to do it when you're in high school or when you're in college because you have your friends your teammates around but think about from like 07 through 2012 for you that's a super lonely journey i mean you're truly on your own at that point and it's just again relying on your habits to get you through those times yeah actually i know you're a book guy i think there's a new book called tiny habits okay um, that uh, i haven't read i've just heard about it but it's along these same uh, uh topics so, i love this stuff yeah yes yeah, um you know uh, I was very fortunate. I graduated from college in 2005 and then Kerry McCoy became the head coach at Stanford for three years, 05 through 08. He left right before the Olympics in 08. Uh, and he was huge for me in getting me to the next level, which I started to make that transition in terms mm -hmm. of international uh, competition. Uh, but, um, you know, I was the only, in, I was the only guy training at that level. And so it, it was lonely and it was hard sometimes to self-motivate when I'm the only one, uh, you know, pushing, you know, yeah. I didn't have a team around me to help me push. So, um, you know, there's a sacrifice there. And I think ultimately once I left Stanford in 2010, um, you know, I moved back to the Midwest. My wife is from here, Kankakee, Illinois. Um, and I started training in Naperville at overtime with Sean Bormet. Oh, Jake you Kerber. did? Yeah. Mike Poeta. So. Wow. It was the three of us working out and then, you know, Josh Trella would come in. Andrew Howe was like young guy at Wisconsin at the time he would come down, they'd host training camps, but that was the first real time where I was in a totally freestyle environment. Um, That's pretty that helped. Cool. I had no idea that you worked out with a uh, coach for Matt during that time. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that overtime facility, you know, just at the high school level was, you know, one of the best in the country, but People forget that they had some, you know, a pretty solid RTC squad. Guys were coming in all the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I know you've had like Clint, Clint Wattenberg and some of those other guys on the show, Chris Weidman. They were like, I went to training camps with them. Yeah. There. And I don't want to let this go unnoticed. You are now a, I'm going to call you a Chicago suburban resident. So <laughs> everyone knows I love to give props to, uh, to the home state. And we got a two-time Olympian living here in the suburbs now. So that's, that's great. Um, I, don't know about, I don't know about suburbs. There's cornfields all around me. <laughs> I would, I wouldn't call, I would never tell someone who's from Chicago that Kanky Key's a suburb, but since, uh, since we're both, you know, not from here, I can get by with it, but oh my, no. Go. If I told some of my uh, Chicago Italian friends that they'd slap me. <laughs> <laughs> now, a couple of things I wanted to hit on at your Stanford career before we get to the Olympic stuff. Sophomore year in college, you're having kind of a breakout year. You're the number one seed at the Pac-12s, but then you get sixth place and don't even qualify. Talk to me about like your mental state from that Saturday night up until you got the call that you were in, like, where were you at? And how was that? How did that shape the rest of your career? Um, it absolutely was a defining moment in my career. And I think, you know, there's a silver lining in everything. Um, or, you, you know, greatest strength is also weakness. Weakness is also strength. Failure can also get turned into success. And I think that's what that Pac-12 or Pac-10 tournament was for me. Pac-10. Um, yeah, Pac-10, thank you. Uh, and it was, you know, uh, I just, I wasn't as prepared. I put a lot of pressure on myself mentally and I didn't perform well. And so I went one and three um, at the tournament. And then- As the uh, number one seed, right? As the number one seed, yep. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I will say I lost to Ben Charrington in the first round who ended up being a NCAA champ a couple of years later. So it was, yeah. you know, but I lost to a guy that I had majored during- throughout the season, you know, I just, I had a very poor performance and it was a lot of pressure, a lot of self doubt. Um, I'd had to travel out of town for a family funeral, um, like the weekend prior, but I had about 10 days where I didn't think I was, didn't, didn't think that I had qualified. And then I got that phone call exactly a week before the tournament started and then to the tournament. And, you know, it was just such an, a blessing because 
you know, I didn't really deserve to be there. I hadn't earned that spot. Um, but since somebody got hurt and I got to slide in as the, as a wild card alternate, um, you know, it just, it, it took a lot of pressure off of me. And so, you know, I just, I realized that I was just going to enjoy the opportunity that I had and focus on the process and what was right in front of me instead of, you know, being so concerned with, you know, wanting to win because the, the lost opportunity was more hurtful to me than, uh, you know, not going, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something every sport you hear about in every sport athletes who, you know, put too much pressure on themselves and it, it's not even athletes. It's, it's people in every walk of life. Um, and so after that, were you just wrestling like with a new lease on life? I mean, completely free and wide open. Yeah. You know, I, I did. I mean, I remember actually, so this was 2003. Yeah. Kale Sanderson came back. Uh, so he had just graduated the year before. And I remember he spoke to all the athletes uh, the day before the NCAA tournament. And he's, and somebody that, like, he had a set, set of questions. He was a set of questions that he answered. And one of them was like, how did you handle the pressure? And he said, I just focused on what I could control. And that was it. And so there's very little you can control once the tournament day starts. You know, you can control a lot in training. Um, and then afterwards, then you just got to focus on, you know, uh, just the little things, which is good warm up and, uh, you know, making sure that if you're not in the right frame of mind, you figure out what works for you to get back to that space. And so, you know, I just, uh, for me, it was focusing on the, you know, that this is a opportunity that I love wrestling. And so I'm going to take advantage of it. And yeah. ultimately that helped me, you know, uh, I battled with the mental side of sport. I had, you know, times where I regressed and then, you know, went forward and then regressed and get forward as I learned more as I matured. So, um, you know, that, that year I went four and two, um, at the NCAA tournament after going one and three in the PAC 10. And, uh, I was winning my last match against Shane Roller from Oklahoma state. Uh, and it was like a crazy match and I ended up by getting pinned. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the time I actually had the lead. So, didn't you wrestle him in the first round of that tournament? You know, I wrestled uh, Keaton Anderson from Ohio State. Got it. Okay. Um, he had no ACL at that time, and uh, it was the year he'd blown it out, and he he whooped me pretty good, actually. It, but it, I gave him a – I mean, I wrestled well. But that loss to Roller, that was the – it must have been another year you wrestled him at the NCAAs, but that, um, that loss to Roller, that was your last loss, you know, up until 60-some matches later. Is that Correct. right? Yeah. So then my junior year, I went undefeated 42 and 0. Um, and, you know, I, that I, I realized I had performed so well at NCAAs and I beat some, I beat somebody that I lost to earlier in the year. Then I had a great match with roller. Um, and I was like, man, this attitude works. I got to keep doing it. And so, you know, that summer I focused on, you know, I wasn't as good on the mat. I was a little bit better on my feet. So you know, I did all mat wrestling that spring and summer, mm -hmm. you know, in the room that summer, guys want to go on their feet and they like, no, we're going live on the mat. And I spent a ton of time, uh, focusing on those areas. And, um, I just, and then I just, just kept building the, my own self belief in myself to where, you know, I tell people this story sometimes, but I was wrestling Ryan Bertine in the semifinals. He was a defending NCAA champ and we went to overtime match could have gone either way. I usually, you know, could have lost the matches. He's a four-time All-American, two-time champ. Um, but I had such belief in myself. I really, I would have been in shock if I had lost, even though it could have happened, but I just I had that level of belief. That scramble at the end was crazy. I like got, now they might've called that too long before, you know, but it was like teeter and you didn't know what way it was going to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's a great match. Absolutely. Tell me about your, you know, during that junior season, when you're really in the groove, you're going undefeated, what's your daily routine like in terms of workouts, um, any work you're doing on yourself to keep your, your mental game high? I mean, what were some of your routines that were part of your routine? Sorry, part of your uh, practice back then? Sure. Um, you know, not too different from, uh, I think, I focused a little, I spent, I committed more time to the mental side 
So I did visualization almost every day. And I think that was really important to me, um, uh, especially that year. And, um, but, you know, little things, my, my weight wasn't a real issue. I weighed about 163 that year. So cutting to 57 wasn't that big of a deal, but I would, you know, one of my goals uh, that year was to do one thing extra every day. Um, and just the, you know, if it was one sprint or one set of uh, pull-ups at the end of practice, that was enough. But then sometimes it was, you know, a lot extra. Um, so I think, you know, little habits like that yeah. helped. And would you visualize the match or would you visualize like a new skill you're working on? Um, visualization, I think it's like goal setting <laughs> in some ways. Like, um, I think I didn't learn, I don't know if I was doing it then, uh, but visualization should really be, uh, more realistic. So you should visualize like hard situations, a bad call and, and men staying mentally focused after a bad call or going out of bounds right when you were about to score and then having to restart in the middle or, um, you know, a really close match where you have to hold on to the leg to win or, or whatever the situation is. So, um, not just visualizing, you know, a perfect, right. perfect effortless, you know, blast through double and he falls over and then you, you know, throw in a half Nelson and pin him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, the, I'm just so fascinated by this and people who are listening who don't like this stuff are probably ready to turn it off. Cause I talk about this as much <laughs> as I can. It's just so fascinating to me that all these great performers are, are doing something between the ears almost every single day. Sometimes it's uh, subconsciously, sometimes, you know, it's not, but you know, for you, that was part of your practice. And so you, you have this incredible turnaround year, your senior year, you did not place. How much did that motivate you to go on and wrestle in 2008? Um, a, a little, um, it, a little bit of both. I think that I was already starting to lean towards trying to compete. Yeah. Um, even after I won in Cibolets, it opened some opportunities for me to, to train at the OTC and things like that. Um, and so I started to get like, uh, and then uh, I was actually teammates at Stanford with Patricia Miranda, who is, uh, you know, Olympic bronze medalist oh, yeah. in the 2004 Olympics. So I was able to go watch her win that medal. And so then going to the Olympics in 2004, which was in between my, you know, junior and senior year, uh, you know, it was a great experience. And I'm like, this would be an awesome experience for me to have. If I have this opportunity, I'm going to try and chase it. So how did you get to go to Athens? Just, just by chance or as part of her training camp? No, uh, I, I had gone to the Olympic training center and, and uh, befriended uh, Sasha Petrovich, which is Momir's, who is the Greco USA Greco coach's son. Okay. And so, I mean, I remember he's like, oh yeah, uh, we'll fly into my hometown and then we'll just drive down to Greece and like flying into Greece. I couldn't afford to fly there, but flying to Budapest, which is in Hungary, uh, which is like somewhat near his hometown and then driving down was like reasonable. Well, I remember sitting down on the airplane, uh, and like, I looked up on a map of Europe and I was like, oh my God, like, Budapest is not close to Athens at all. And so <laughs> it was like a 24 hour drive through the night on like country roads to get there. It was crazy. Oh my God. That's, cr that is crazy, man. What, um, I mean, what memories do you have of that 2004 Olympics that stand out to you when, whenever someone asks you about it? Um, you know, I think I fell in love with like the Olympics and the idea of it, but uh, you know, when you go as a fan, it's a, it's, it's more like a party in terms of it's very fun, you know, mm -hmm. and you're, you're going out, you're seeing events and you're seeing all these people. And then when you go as an athlete, you're, you're, it's more business. It's not as much like enjoyment, you know, because you have goals to achieve. And yeah. so I think that's the biggest difference. And, um, and, you know, I, I think I was ready for it, but, uh, the like grandioseness or uh, of it or grandiosity or whatever the word is to that's what I fell in love with. Especially as like, you know, you're a young college man, you just won the nationals, you're riding high, you're at the Olympics. I mean, that had to be a, just a great experience. Yeah, absolutely. And so there was a couple of places I wanted to go, but I'll just ask because it's on my mind in 2012, 
you made it to the Olympics. So anyone listening knows you're a two-time Olympian. 2012, you made the decision not to stay in the village after the opening ceremonies. Why was that? Uh, you know, actually, that was a, we, we did that in 2008 as well. Um, and actually, that's, um, you know, uh, I, I, and I wrestled for the Canadian Olympic team. Very proud to have represented Canada at the Olympics. But um, they, and, and this is just something they've done uh, for as long as I know, know they have, is that, uh, you know, the, if you talk about energy management, wrestling competes towards the end of the, end of the games, last few days usually. And so uh, being inside the Olympic Village, especially as other athletes start to finish up their competition, um, it's just a very high energy place. And so for energy management purposes, um, we got out of, you know, you're having to travel to train, you know, they don't, didn't have mats inside the Olympic village for us to go to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we went to some facilities where we could stay, where we were training, you know, where the food court, wherever the food situation, the meal situation was insane in all in the same building. So we're not spending time on buses and transporting and just being around all that high energy, which can be draining. So, and this is a rookie question, but where do you guys stay when you're at the Olympics? Is it dorms? Is it a hotels? Uh, usually, um, and I don't know if this is the way it is always, but it was for my experiences with the Pan Am games and the Olympic games, um, is they'll build like high rises, uh, or big apartment complexes. Um, and then they won't finish them. They won't finish the interior. So then they'll turn like, say it's going to be a three bedroom condo. They'll turn it into like six bedrooms without a kitchen or, you know, just two bath and six bedrooms with like knockdown walls. And then they'll put, you know, 12 athletes or 10 athletes or whatever fits into these spaces. Really? And then after the Olympics, uh, they turn into private like condo high, high rises. Got it. So looking back, is that a decision that you would do again? Or is that something you regret not being part of that experience? No, I think it definitely is, is performance enhancing to, to have that. Yeah. Um, you, you just get to go focus and, uh, you know, do your taper and, you know, you're still with your team. Um, and then on our off day, um, I think both Olympics, I got to see at least one other event. Uh, uh, you know, I think I went to see judo, um, mm -hmm. you know, which was great because then I got to see the venue um, before I competed in it. Uh, so that's a I long, think, I think that's a long time to sit around. I mean, wrestling is one of the last sports every time. Yeah, no, you, you, you're right. So, um, 2000, uh, uh, 2008, it was not good for me to be by myself. So I remember checking my heart rate in my, in our hotel room where or it was our, we were at a school. So, uh, in our dorm room and I had my own room and, I talked about regressing in terms of mental side of sport. I think I had put so much pressure on myself in 2008. I had like anxiety just sitting in my hotel room. I checked my pulse and it was about a hundred beats per minute. You know, this is a time when my pulse was probably in like the high forties as a, like a well-conditioned athlete, yeah. but that, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good situation to have all that time and be myself in my own little world and working myself up. And so, you know, the 2012, the next Olympics, I told my training partner, Jeff Adamson, I said, Hey, I hope you didn't want your own room because I need to, I need somebody to keep me calm. So, yeah, I mean, that was, I'm glad you said that. Cause I wanted to segue into, you know, anxiety management um, and just comparing it to like the NCAAs to the Olympics, NCAAs are longer and more of a grind, but the Olympics, at least in 2012, I'm not sure about 08, but it was like four matches in four hours. And that was it. You know, so how, how would you compare and contrast the, uh, just the, the NCAA tournaments versus the Olympics in terms of just the strain on your, on your mind? Um, I think, you know, it's actually, if you start to get some momentum, I think it's actually easier with the Olympics because, mm -hmm. you know, you start, you get a couple of good wins under, or, you know, a good win and then upset somebody. And, you know, you see it all the time, people go on hot runs. And then uh, because it's all one day, once they get that momentum, you know, they build it throughout the, the, the one day versus to having to come back and sustain momentum, uh, you know, over a three day span. Um, but, you know, I think 
you know, uh, you know, the old rules, and, uh, you know, one day tournaments mm -hmm. uh, for the Olympics were, you know, a little bit more, you had to make sure you're doing a good job, you know, training to be in shape to recover. Yeah. But at least you're not having to go back to the hotel and think about it. I mean, like when you wrestled Bertine in the semis, you know, you had all day Friday to think about that. And sometimes that can be the downfall for folks. Obviously not for you because you, you know, you made it through there and then you end up winning it. But it's just such a, uh, you know, you said something earlier where some days you woke up and just didn't feel it. You know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, shoot, what if that's the day of the Olympics? You wake up and you're feeling that way. You know, like what, what would you have done to get yourself right if you were competing? Uh, you know, I, I would, I had a, I knew that that was a possibility. I mean, it's a possibility anytime I tell kids that. And so it's just, it's important to know what makes you tick. And then it's important to have that support staff or, you know, a, a lot of people, a lot of kids, especially like they think everything has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And so um, if it's not, they're afraid to say, Hey coach, I just don't feel great today. And so you got to one, know yourself and know what makes you tick. And then if you don't feel like this is a great day. You got to tell your coach or your teammate or your parents or somebody you trust and love and say, Hey, get, let's, let's get me back to the right space. I'm not in it right, right yet. And so I think uh, preparation is super important. And so if you can, you know, prepare those, those people and say, this is what works for me. I want you to say this and uh, it, it, it's going to help. And if you need to, you go lean on them. That's what they're there for. To have the honesty to tell a coach that you're not feeling it the day of, at, at, especially at the high school or college level, that takes a lot of trust. Yeah, absolutely. It takes a, a lot of humility too. Yeah. To say, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not perfect, and I'm not perfect every day. And but it comes, it comes back to growth mindset, I think, and being willing to, uh, to, to, to risk something because you know that if you fail, it's not a personal reflection on you. It's just an opportunity to, to grow. Mm -hmm. Man, it's fascinating. I, I love these conversations. Um, one thing I did want to ask you kind of off subject is I understand just from your blog that you had a trip to, is it Macedonia or Mardova, Mar Moldova? Uh, Macedonia. What, uh, what inspired that trip and what was it, what was it like there? Just give us a preview of uh, your time there. Cause I've obviously never, never spoke to anyone who's been there. Uh, Macedonia. Um, it was actually part of a combo trip. I think we can, we did a double tour or a double competition tour. So we went over there, man, you're pulling it out there. Let's see, 2010, I think it might've been or, or Oh nine somewhere in there. Um, and I, I actually, I had a pretty poor performance. Oh yeah. And then I think we went on and wrestled in Ukraine. So, or, or, or Georgia. Uh, and anyway. Um, Not even the competition stuff more so, but just like, you know, I mean, what, what, what's it like there? I mean, I understand you guys are playing soccer with a bunch of 12 year olds and flip flops and um, just, <laughs> just sounds like a, a pretty uh, unique experience. Um, I mean, I feel, yeah, I, that uh you know i'm very fortunate to have had a lot of those wrestling is, has given me that um but it, that was probably random you know yeah just some something some maybe some kids that were we, we always played soccer to warm up overseas it's a super common warm-up mm. and so uh you know my teammates uh you know on the canadian national team they were pretty good <laughs> i bet yeah and it was uh it's so random that the you know, the 84 Olympics, you know, the Eastern Bloc countries weren't there, but that they had, uh, I think, their only Olympic champ from that particular games. And he must be some kind of hero over there now. Yeah, it, it's, um, you know, a lot of those countries, if you, you know, you become an Olympic champ, you're a household name. Yeah. So, and so after 2008, how, how committed were you to going to 2012 at that point? Um, you know, I wasn't because uh, that's when Karen McCoy left. He went back to Maryland and then uh, hired Jason Borelli, who's still the head coach at Stanford. And I became a full-time assistant. Um, and so really, you know, I didn't really have a coach training me. And so I was having to travel to Canada, you know, to do more of my freestyle training. Um, and I was just committing a lot more to the Stanford program, uh, you know, 2008 through 2010. And, you know, as a result, my performances went down. 
Um, I didn't make the world team in, in 09 or 2010. And so, you know, at that point, 2010, I really wasn't committing as, you know, I was, I, I was getting drawn away from my full-time assistant coaching duties at Stanford and, you know, Ray Blake, Jason Borelli and I were all really young coaches. And so mm -hmm. we were committing a lot as we tried to figure out how to manage a division one program. And I was getting pulled away from that. And then the, that was pulling me away from my own training. And so 2010, I made the best decision for myself, which was to, you know, focus on one. And so I ended up by choosing competing, which then meant that I needed to find a different situation. So, you know, there were some other, other things that went into it and some changes in within the uh, university, the, the athletic department, but, yeah. um, but ultimately it was best for my performance. And in the next two years, I had my best performances. So even through those, you know, those 09, 2010 years, even though the, the results weren't there, you were still committed to 2012? Um, I was pretty much, you know, I was committed to those years, I would say. And then 2010 was kind of the turning point where I said, if I'm going to commit to 2012, I need to stop coaching and commit to 2012. Mm -hmm. Before I was trying to do both. And then it, I realized it just, it really didn't, wasn't working for me. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing now that you know the rtcs a lot of folks don't have to do those dual roles but i mean what did the did the canadian national team offer any type of funding or, or training support or did they even have a national team back then yeah no they still they, they do and they still do and they do they actually have a better uh stipend support system than uh the u.s and so wow. um um you know, I was getting paid a little bit. I mean, not enough to cover my rent in, in the Bay Area, but oh it was still- Oh my God, yeah. You know, I used to live in San Francisco. It was yeah, brutal. It is brutal. Um, and so, you, you know, it's something, um, but, you know, my perception is that athletes now act, have a lot better financial opportunities than even 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. Even outside the financial aspect of it, um, did the Canadian national team get together for training camps throughout the year, kind of like we do in Colorado Springs? Yeah, yeah. We, you know, a lot of the training uh, was club-based. So, you know, I competed for the Burnaby Mountain Wrestling Club in Burnaby, which is right outside of uh, Vancouver, mm -hmm. uh, British Columbia, which is where my family's from. And um, so, you know, Burnaby would go to, you know, our – Burnaby Mountain and my coaches Dave McKay, who's also the national team coach, uh, and Justin Abdu, uh, who's a you know great NAIA champ for uh, Simon Fraser. Anyway, these guys would you know we travel to train, mm -hmm. so we you know I, we we did training camps at Colorado Springs quite often, or we'd go overseas or um, or host guys. We flew guys into Vancouver to help us train. So, and what do you take away from your time? working out with coach Bormet at overtime? Um, you know, I think consistency, you know, uh, and practice planning. I take a lot. He, he's, he's good at, uh, at coming at, uh, you know, developing that practice plan with, uh, with long-term plan in mind, not, Hey, what are we going to do today? You know, the, his practices fit into a bigger picture that that's very well thought out. So yeah, he's uh, super meticulous like that. I mean, just a, a consummate planner. And was that something you hadn't done before that on your own? Uh, you know, I don't think I had noticed it as much. You know, I, I'm part of, you know, as an athlete, I often go to practice and say, coach, what's what's the plan today? Yeah. You know, and as, as I got older, I was taking more ownership. But uh, of that and kind of self-reflection and what I needed to do. But um, I think I just, I felt it more with, with Coach Barmet than, than I might have noticed. Mm -hmm. And so going into 2012, I mean, the morning of the competition, you are as seasoned and grizzled as you could possibly be at that point. I mean, you have been living the lifestyle for, you know, better part of a decade. Where were you at mentally the morning of 2012? I feel like you're calling, you were calling me old just then. No, um, no. Just I, <laughs> I was, uh, I turned 30 like a week before the Olympics uh, or, or a week before I competed. Uh, but um, my, my buddies or my training partner like to point out that I was the oldest guy in the, in my bracket, but. Um, but just think about how many wars you had been through, how many ups and downs at that point. I mean, you were so seasoned. I mean, you yeah. had seen it all. 
And I, I'm glad you talk about that because, you know, I was an NCAA champion and a two-time Olympian and I, I placed fifth in the Olympics, which is um, obviously less than what I wanted and more than 99% of wrestlers. 99.99999. But, 99. <laughs> but most, most people don't know that I didn't place at the Worlds four times prior. I didn't place at the Olympics before. I didn't place at NCAA as the year after winning. Um, you know, I didn't. I never repeated as a state champ, I was a two-time state champ, but lost as a junior. So I had, I feel like as many successes as I had, I also had setbacks. And those are super important to talk about because people, uh, you know, comparison is the death of happiness, but everybody does it. Everybody wants to compare. So um, just know that everybody's journey is going to have ups and downs. And man, I can't say that enough because I, I had so many and so many where, you know, I was thinking I, I had, I actually developed more anxiety probably in 2008 and nine. Part of it was preparation or sorry, 2009 and 10. And then I kind of overcame that in 2011. And I started to realize, uh, I started to get back to my fundamentals um, of, of uh, you know, focusing on the right things to, to compete better. So to process where did you, where did you uh come up with that comparing comparison is the death of happiness um maybe it's yours maybe it's not but when did that really start sinking in for you because that's a that's powerful yeah i you know i don't know i think that's something somebody told me or i read it somewhere or, um but you know it's true <laughs> everybody's journey is individual man i mean especially in any type of results-based business wrestling where everyone knows the results um, or now with social media, everyone's feeling that um, in some way or another. Um, I don't know if you've watched Social Dilemma or not. Have you watched that I one? Have. Oh yeah, absolutely. Woo! That'll that'll put a fear in you for a while. Um, exactly. And Tim Kendall. Uh, I hope we talk about this, but Tim Kendall, who uh, he was the Pinterest, uh, president of Pinterest, he, he's a Stanford wrestling alum. So he, really? he's yeah, he's heavily featured in that Social Dilemma. I didn't know he wrestled. That's amazing. Yep. Holy cow. Like when you were there or he would have graduated, I think the year before I got there, but I, I mean, I knew him and I knew of him. Wow. That seems like a prime guest for the podcast. I got to do some prospecting there. That's okay. pretty, that's pretty amazing. Um, it's so, and I just looked at the time. I can't believe how long we've been talking, but I have to, I have to ask this because in uh, 2012, you wrestled Sargouche for bronze and everyone knows Sargouche because of his battles with JB. And he's obviously one of the greats. I couldn't find the full match and the, really the match doesn't matter. I, I really wanted to ask you this though. If you don't remember, it's fine, but what would you have been telling yourself before you stepped on the mat for the bronze medal match against Sargouche? Did you have any rituals or any routines or were you completely Zen? Um, you know, for me, I knew, I always told myself, you know, heavy hands, fast feet, hard finishes, because I knew if I did those things, I was going to wrestle well. So that's kind of what I was focused on. And then, all my visualization leading up to 2012 Olympics was how did I want to feel stepping on the mat? Once the whistle blows, uh, you know, my training is going to take over. But so I wanted to visualize my, my preparation so that then, you know, I wanted to visualize being cool, calm, collected, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like that, you know, rocket ship that's on the countdown, the, the engines are going, but it hasn't started to move yet. So, uh, but you could just see that energy building up and that's kind of what I wanted to visualize in my own body. So um, I think I, I'd done a good job. I'd actually wrestled him in the finals of Sardinia, a really small tournament in Italy. He didn't know who I was. And I had, um, I actually, he scored with like one second left in the first period. I lost the first period. This is the old, old oh rules, God. the terrible rules. And then I actually gave, a, I scored a takedown in the second uh, and then he got a reversal to win. And I, he'd been taking the tournament very lightly. He was on vacation practically. Um, it was like a beach town in Italy. Um, but you know, I had wrestled him very physically and very aggressively and he, he wasn't ready for it. And I took it. Uh, and then, I, you know, his coaches were really pissed at him, uh, for having a close match against, you know, I mean, he was a couple of times, he was a world champ at that point. Um, and so I kind of took that same mindset or game plan into the bronze. And I think it was a mistake because he adjusted and I didn't. Um, so, you know, the, the match, you know, he didn't, he didn't. Uh, um, so anyway, it was, 
I still think about it. But, Did you ever get a chance to go to Russia and train during your travels? Um, you know, my visa got denied. So the only training camp I ever had there um, got denied. But, you know, I trained in Georgia, Ukraine, Azerbaijan. So I trained in a lot of those, you know, Soviet Union countries. But yeah. Russia itself, I competed uh, as a backup in the uh, 2010 Worlds. So Got it. Okay. That was in Moscow, 2010? Uh-huh. I would have been a sweet one to go to right in the yeah. motherland. Yeah. Um, I did want to reserve some time to talk about this, the state of Stanford wrestling. And ironically, I had coach Borelli on a Monday. What a gem he is. I mean, just He's awesome. Awesome guy. Um, had no idea that it was the same family. Who, his dad coaches at central Michigan. Oh, Crazy. Yeah. Um, tell me about, you know, what do you think outside of money or outside of support, you know, what can we do to make the biggest impact on this? Or is it kind of out of our hands at this point? Um, so I think the biggest uh, impact you can make is influence. And that is uh, we have to pressure the administration that, that their decision is wrong. Um, and so I think writing a positive, uh, you know, the action item that people can make besides donating money, which is always going to help. Um, although they're at a point where they've self endowed the program, 12 know, million, <laughs> $12 million, um, you know, and, and to put that into perspective, if you add then the estate plans, which is, you know, when somebody, uh, passes on, they're going to donate a certain amount. If you add that planning, um, it would endow the operating budget and more scholarships than the program had when I competed. Um, Wow. So, you know, they could be back to better than where they were 15 or 20 years ago when I was wrestling for Stanford, but um, 15, <laughs> but, but uh, uh, besides money, I think it's influence and, and that's, um, you know, going to the keep Stanford wrestling web uh, website, which is keep Stanford wrestling.com and clicking on some of their talking points and then contacting some of those administrators because um you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a battle, but wrestlers don't quit. So I'm, I'm sure that there's going to continue to be some um, influence that needs to be exerted on those administrators to get them to change their decision. And, you know, the reality is the, the stated reasons don't match. No. So um, the competitive excellence, it's like they were the PAC 12 or is it Pac-10 or Pac-12? I was getting confused. So when I competed, it was the Pac-10. They've changed it to the, become the Pac-12 in the last Pac-12. five years. When they, I mean, they won the Pac-12 in 2019. They were second in 2010. So competitive excellence is there. Financially, as you just mentioned, the $12 million endowment, I had Coach Borelli break it down, but historically that's a you know one of the biggest, if not the biggest endowments, you know, outside of contributions for facilities and things like that. It's just... He, he told us that, you know, you can make 600 grand a year off, off the interest and that alone, you know, could, could, could fund the program. Um, not, a, not from a scholarship basis, but as you mentioned with the estate plan, if you add that in, so it's just so frustrating. I mean, you have, if you're Stanford, you have a team that's top 20 every year, the guys running the program are, you know, top notch, you know, class A guys. I don't see why you would not want it. And I just, I don't, do you think it has to do with, the gender equity piece of it like if there was a women's aspect to it would that help yeah and part of the you know part of the strategy to bring to keep stanford wrestling is to um raise enough money to endow a women's program and to start women's you know women's wrestling at the collegiate level is the future you know it's headed in that direction and um you know i think the wrestling community is embracing it um so that's great and so if if we could help start that i think it's going to help us as well um, uh, but you know, I, in my opinion, it's, you know, and I don't study collegiate athletics, but you know, it's just the changing, it's the shift of, you know, college athletics used to be about student athletes and, and creating opportunities, but I think it's changing to be more of a business driven, uh, money oriented, which just comes down to football and men's basketball, unfortunately. Yeah. It's, it is, it's sad. I mean, it, it really does just bum me out. I mean, anytime you hear about a college program going down, it's a bummer, but you think about Stanford, a pillar of the Pac-12, academic excellence. I mean, it's just such a rare thing. It's like Harvard, Cornell, Northwestern, Stanford. Like Those are some really 
high quality programs people can go to if they want to get the education that you got. And of course, there's Princeton. I'm not, you know, I want to list all of them, but yeah, it just really hurts to see that happen. And then you look at a school like the Cal Poly, they might say, well, sh- well, shit, we don't have the budget Stanford has. Why, why are we not dropping wrestling? You know, it's yeah. like really scary stuff. So, I mean, the advice you gave is sound. I mean, writing a letter where it's not complaining, but it's, it's, it's positive, but it's firm on, on what, what the program means to the wrestling world. I mean, is this something that just totally caught you off guard when it happened? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I don't, I'm, I hope Jason, uh, Coach Borelli, talked about the manner in which Stanford went about it. You know, Stanford kind of prides itself on being different, and, you know, setting the bar, and it just felt very underhanded. It was behind closed doors. You know, the coaches and athletes got an email um, like 30 minutes before, and that there was a basically a televised uh, feed. It wasn't even a two-way communication. It wasn't a Zoom call where they could, you know, talk back to the athletic director. It was a one-way communication where the athletic director said sorry um you know uh, we're reprioritizing and you're not in that prioritization so yeah. um it, it was just a you know they didn't engage the the people involved and if they would have the i mean we've, we've raised 12 million dollars after the fact i think if if there had been some kind of uh willingness to work with the communities that you know some of those issues could be resolved and and frankly they still can be yeah. if we can get them to come to the table. So that's all it is. just, we're just asking for an opportunity here. I mean, geez, it's like, yeah, you know, I just don't see uh, the reasoning behind it unless there's just some people there that just frankly don't appreciate like the bruteness of wrestling. I mean, it, you know, we all know how San Francisco in that area, it's a bubble, you know, and those, there's some interesting yeah. cats out there, but you know, I don't know. I, if, is it simple as that? People just don't like the sport there. I mean, the, well, if you don't like the sport, then you can't also claim to love diversity because, the, you know, Stanford you know, wrestling is a different breed of characters and um, th- they bring a lot of uh, diversity to that campus because, yeah. you know, Stanford doesn't want to be a country club university. Right. And, you know, but, you know, and wrestling kind of helps, you know, the, I think 44 um, percent of, of uh, Stanford athletes over the last 10 years are first generation uh, college athletes or low income, um, which is not your, you know, the Stanford average is like 14% or something. Yeah. Um, you'd have to, maybe you can link to the show notes about the, what those exact stats are, but you know, Stanford brings, Stanford wrestling brings a ton of diversity to uh, that campus. So. Yeah. That's one of the biggest things uh, that I've read in the keep Stanford wrestling website, you know, college wrestlers in general are, a, there's a higher percentage of first generation college students among wrestlers than some other sports. And I'm sure all sports contribute to that, but um, wrestling certainly is at the top of that list if I'm reading or recalling that stat correctly. So, yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time, Matt Gentry. This has been awesome to chat with you. I yeah, love that I you're in the, are, are you doing a camps, clinicians, coaching in Chicagoland? Or are you a, a family man now? Um, Both. <laughs> no, uh, I, um, I do run like a small freestyle club at, out of uh, Bishop McNamara uh, uh, school here. Um, uh, we run a free, we have a freestyle program, which obviously was canceled last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I'm fired up to get back to it. You know, my boys are six and five. So, um, you know, I'm struggling. Another passion of mine is becoming a sports parent and, and youth wrestling and become, you know, having positive experiences, which I know is a, a topic of yours. So Woo, That's a whole back can of worms right it, there. It is. And, I, and I'm struggling. I don't know what the right answer is. So I'd love to get your perspective maybe another time. So Yeah, we could talk about coaching another time. I got to tell you, Bishop Mack, they had a guy when I was there, Mike Ryan, who tough guy, Mike man. Ryan. Yeah, he won it, and then they moved him up to Double A the next year. The school got jumped up to Double A, and he beat me in the first round. I believe it was, it was either like a one pointer or overtime. But he's uh he's he's the man. He lives out in California now. But yeah, I didn't know if he did. oh yeah, definitely. I'm yeah. learning my history. There you go. Well, it's great to have you in Illinois, and thank you very much for your time today, sir. Yeah, thank you for having me.